Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing on Bedford Place in Bloomsbury, WC1. One street east of Vera Crawford's killing. One street south of where the unfortunate Mr. Johnson's killer took a snooze. The same street as the arrest of Zachariah Buller. And a few houses from the feet which stank. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Built in 1805, Bedford Place consists of two rows of Georgian townhouses with white stucco walls and black wrought iron railings on the ground floor with brown brick and white sills on the three floors above. It's easy to get confused as with every house looking identical, the neighbors' lives must resemble a bawdy sex farce from the 1960s. <laughs> as several randy salesmen kiss their frumpy wives, dart next door to doink a saucy strumpet silly, oh, hello. only to realize that he's either boffed his wife, the vicar, a dog, or knowing this neighborhood, a tub of avocado and hummus sashimi. <laughs> On the night of Monday, the 18th of May, 1942, 33-year-old part-time prostitute, Jean Stafford, was waiting in her ground floor room at three Bedford Place for a man. As a good woman in a bad situation, she hoped that this potential husband would end her struggle and take away her misery. And although this expectant guest arrived, that night, he erased her pain by ending her life. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide. And this is Murder Mile. Episode 245. Good Girl Gone. The death of Jean Stafford makes no sense at all when you look at her life. Her real name was Agnes Martin. Born on the 3rd of August 1909 in the village of Deepcar, a few miles north of Sheffield. Although she adopted several monikers, she never lost her strong Yorkshire accent. Raised in a working-class family of coal miners and quarrymen, Agnes, who preferred to be called Jean after the actress Jean Harlow, was the only step-sibling in this family of twelve, so felt that she never belonged. Little is known of her upbringing, but growing to be a small but sturdy girl with pale skin, blue eyes and apple blossom cheeks. Her shyness endeared her to others. Her quietness meant she was rarely in trouble. And her sweetness attracted her to older men, who she liked, as she often sought a father figure. As the run to the litter, after the death of her mother when she was just 15, Jean left the family home. For eight years, as a young solitary girl, we know nothing about her life, except her work as a cook and a housemaid in Barnsley and Harrogate. But in 1932, when she was aged just 23, her life had changed forever. Having moved 70 miles east to Hull, Agnes Martin had become Jean Smith a common name it was all too easy to confuse with others, and for good reason. As being a single woman, earning a dishonest crust in a city where she wasn't known, she was cautioned twice for soliciting. As a sweet-faced girl with a kindly manner, she didn't have any convictions for prostitution. She didn't have any charges for drunkenness, as she rarely drank. She had never been to prison, as she didn't steal or cheat from her clients. In fact, 
they often came back as she was good and honest. And although a solidly built girl, who many said could easily handle herself, she never got into fights and was rarely attacked. Later that year, having dyed her hair platinum blonde and being dressed in a faux leopard skin coat, Jean met 49-year-old retired sports writer James Stafford, also known as Jim. A quiet, unassuming sugar daddy, who many described as foolishly generous with his £3,000 inheritance, quarter of a million pounds today, who would lavish the lady who he loved to posh meals, nights out and fancy clothes, treating her as a kept woman. On the 7th of February 1933, under the alias of Jean Smith, Agnes Martin technically became Jean Stafford, and they happily lived together in the Springbank district of Hull. Or at least they did, for a while. As although James would state, she had no sense of the value of money, he had a gambling addiction. He later said, My wife was a strong woman, attractive, pleasant, exceedingly generous, and able to look after herself. So having got herself a job as a housemaid at the Angel Arms pub in Brixton, South London, with no bad blood between them, the last time he saw her alive was on Valentine's Day of 1938. But four and a half years later, he identified her body on a cold slab of marble at Holborn Mortuary. By the outbreak of the Second World War, with a city in chaos, Jean earned a tiny wage as a tidy housemaid and a crafty cook in several public houses in the West End. And although she was given a bed to sleep in, with the Argyle and the Cooper Arms both being bombed. Everything she owned was destroyed. Jobs were scarce, food was rationed, and with so many potential husbands called up to fight, the pickings were slim. On Saturday the 18th of October 1941, carrying the few items that she still owned. Jean called at Three Bedford Place, having seen a room to let sign. Greeted by Joseph Lamb, the 40-year-old warehouseman who lived in the basement, his evidence proved invaluable. And although the police stated, he knows more about her than anyone, but denies being intimate with her, this wasn't exactly a revelation, as Joseph was gay. Having agreed to pay 30 shillings a week for a ground floor, back room, and a shared kitchenette and a bathroom with the other 12 tenants, Joseph told the police, she introduced a tall man, saying, this is my friend, he's helping me pay the rent. She never said his name, but he was described as late 40s to 50s, dark hair, deep set eyes, swarthy and broad, with a Jewish nose and a deep voice. For Jean, life at Three Bedford Place was good. Owned by Mrs. Hornheap, who she rarely saw, it was managed by Edith O'Connell, the housekeeper, with Joseph keeping an eye on things in the evenings and every Sunday when Edith wasn't there. As a private person who spent most of her time alone in her room, Jean regularly received men friends. Occasionally she got some post, and a few times a week on the communal telephone in the hallway, she received a call. 
with the ground floor split into three rooms. Jean's was barely big enough for a single bed, a sofa, a dressing table, a gas fire, a lamp, and with so few clothes in the wardrobe, the tenants often saw her wearing just a thin frock. Or according to Joseph, I've seen her in bed, sitting up. She was bare. As a quiet girl, who often sat alone, knitting in front of the fire. Although she only spoke in passing to the other tenants, who were always polite, she got on best with Joseph. As hardly a day went by without her popping her head into my room, he would say. And to help each other out, as a good cook, she often made his meals which he left in the cupboard for when he returned home from work. But not every tenant in the house was as pleasant. Joseph said, Jean told me she'd asked Mr. Pollard, an ex-army captain who was living in the adjoining room, to set a mousetrap. And she was terrified of the mice which scuttled from the kitchen. Having done so, he had tried to fondle her, as being an alcoholic who'd lost his career and his family, having been convicted of buggery. George Pollard was a sex pest, but there was no proof that he'd killed her. In the ensuing investigation, the police examined the lives of a wealth of suspects especially as by the Christmas of 1941, with the tall man having left her following a tiff. Jean had returned to selling sex. Joseph said, I didn't know that she was a prostitute. As she kept her life private, rarely drank, shuttled her clients from the door to her room in silence, and she tried to keep the sex as quiet as possible. But detectives were able to track down several of her clients. In keeping with her good-natured way, her sex work wasn't sleazy and cheap, but innocent and sweet. Private Ronald Ward of the Royal Montreal Regiment said... On the 18th of January 1942, at 10 p.m., outside of the Lions Corner House Tea Room in Piccadilly, where she regularly solicited, she asked me if I'd like to go home with her. I asked how much. She said one pound and ten shillings, and I said okay. At roughly a hundred pounds today, she charged more than most. But being sweet, she reassured the timid ones. She cheated no one, and knowing that many men simply miss their girlfriends, instead of just sex, she gave these boys what they needed. Having walked back to Three Bedford Place, Jean asked Ronald to be as quiet as possible as they entered the hallway, and having unlocked the door to her small room, instead of undressing, she made him a meal. With it being wartime, everyone was struggling. So as part of a good nature, they sat in front of the gas fire getting warm, eating toast and jam, supping a nice cup of tea, and having a good old natter. It was part of who she was, and if she could convince him to stay over for a little bit extra, all the better. She stripped off all of her clothes, all except her stockings, although she seemed very shy, Ronald said. We had sex twice, or by it quietly, and then we went to sleep. Another client was 42-year-old Coleman Fellerman, who first met her in October 1941, 
and like many, he became a friend. I agreed to go back with Jean. She was in no hurry. In fact, had she not solicited me, I shouldn't have thought that she was a prostitute. And as she often did, she made him food. They chatted, had sex. And with him being in catering, she asked if he could get her a job as a cook. Two weeks later, he interviewed her for a job in Gosport. And although he said, let me know how you get on, he never heard from her again. At the time of her death, he was at his lodgings in Morden. A third client, Gunnar Alexander Campbell of the Canadian Artillery, regularly wrote her letters as he loved that she mothered him. First meeting on the 7th of March 1942, he bought her gifts and paid to stay across most of the weekends in March and April, having telephoned her first. He last saw her alive on the 8th of May 1942, but ten days later when she was murdered, he was stationed at Sittingbourne in Kent. And a fourth client, whose ration book was found in her room, having given it to her as a gift, as I saw that she had hardly any food in her cupboard, was Private Ulf Hupp, a Norwegian ski instructor, whose movements on the night of the murder were accounted for by several witnesses at the Savoy Hotel. All four of those men were ruled out, which is not to say that she only ever had four clients, or that of the few people that she actually spoke to or may have met, that none of them were innocent. Weekly, Jean brought condoms from a vendor in Piccadilly Circus called Sydney Bloom. Six years earlier, Sydney had been quizzed by the police over the murder of Soho prostitute, Josephine Martin. And although an infamous RAF cadet picked up women at the Lion's Corner House Tea Room in Piccadilly in February 1942, by that May, having been found guilty, Gordon Frederick Cummings was already awaiting his execution. None of these men, her friends, or any of her family were suspected of being her murderer. But the police had narrowed it down to just three. The tall man, her caller, and Johnny. Breaking up with the tall man in Christmas 1941, being roughly 50, with deep-set eyes, swarthy skin and a deep voice. He would have been easy to spot. Only after that date, he was never seen again. Johnny, whose real name she never divulged, was described as a dapper-looking cove in his mid-thirties, five foot five inches tall, with fair hair and a slight paunch. Having met him six times prior, Edith, the housekeeper, stated he was always polite with a nice disposition. As just like all of these suspects, he hadn't threatened Jean. As she always chose her clients carefully and she didn't associate with bad men. By the end of April 1942, having split up with Johnny for reasons unknown, Jean was struggling. Being close to broke, she sold her few possessions, a faux leopard skin coat and two handbags at Jimmy's hairdressers on Charlotte Street, as well as the last of her best dresses, leaving her room almost empty. And with her usually large appetite stymied by a recurrent headache and earache, she wasn't well. In fact, since the 24th of April, up until the day of her death, she'd spent much of it in bed.
Monday the 18th of May 1942, was her last day alive. Waking late. As far as we know, she was knitting for a few hours. She saw no one, which wasn't unusual. And with the few coins she had left, she shopped for bread and powdered milk. At 4.30pm, while out, Edith took a phone call for her, which went, Is Miss Stafford there? No, she's out. Will she be back at six? Mm, I guess. Can you let her know? I'm in the Royal Flying Corps now. I'm a nephew of her father's brother. And assuming that Jean knew who he was, as he didn't give it, she didn't take his name or his number. Edith said it was a local call as the ring was long. It wasn't from a phone box as she didn't hear the coins fall. And although she would confirm, it was something like Johnny's voice, but it was definitely not his. Being neither deep, light, nor with an accent, she didn't think that she'd spoken to him before. Every nephew of her father, her brothers, or her husband were accounted for. Every absentee from all the local RAF bases were questioned and ruled out. But with the caller using the term Royal Flying Corps, an archaic term for the Royal Air Force, the police felt that either this was a red herring or Edith had misheard. Either way, Jean read the message and later its charred remains were found in the bin. The rest of that evening was as routine as any other. At 6pm, Joseph returned from work. He waved as he passed her room and said she was her usual self. In the kitchen cupboard, she'd prepared a meal of roast lamb, cauliflower, carrots and mashed potato. And although he returned the plate to her at 7pm, she'd barely eaten half of hers, having been sick for weeks. Sat in a blue and white flower pattern dress, she said that she was going out, but was waiting for a call first. So to pass the time, they chatted as they always did, and with them both smelling a very faint whiff of gas in her room. As Joseph was unable to detect the leak, they queried if this was the cause of a sickness. At 7pm, Kitty Jones, a ground floor tenant, saw her, stating she was wearing all of the jewellery she had, being a metal ring with a stone missing and a cheap wristwatch, which were later found on her body. By 7.15pm, Joseph left to meet his friend, Mr. Claremont, at the Fitzroy Tavern in Fitzrovia and the York Minster in Soho, being two bars frequented by gay men. And at 9pm, Kitty heard Jean welcome a man into her room, who she didn't see, but said they were on friendly terms. And then Kitty left until 10pm. That left, aircraftman Mark LeBlanc and George Hudden on the first floor listening to the radio. And on the ground floor, George Pollard said he was asleep. And with the partition walls being so thin that the tenants could hear each other breathe. From 9pm till 10pm, when it was said her murder occurred, none of them heard a thing. At 9am sharp, Edith the housekeeper was greeted by Joseph on the doorstep as he sorted out the post and called out to Jean. Love, you've got a letter. Which being a late sleeper, she ignored. But by 11.40am, with her door still ajar, 
and Jean having not moved an inch. Seeing the blankets pulled up to her nose, which exposed her toes. As Joseph went to shake her awake, he felt that she was cold. Jean was dead. The room was as she had left it the night before, being neat, orderly and clean. With the drawers shut, the gas fire off, the lamp's shade on the floor suggesting she'd been knitting, the back window open to let a light breeze in, and her knickers and stockings neatly folded on the armchair beside the bed. And with a single cup of tea, half drank, and no other crockery, it looked as if she'd died alone in her sleep. Told of her headache, her earache, and seeing a single spot of blood on the inside of her left ear, with a corresponding stain on the pillow, divisional surgeon Dr. Gregg assumed it was natural, but ordered an autopsy to determine her cause of death. Whether a fever, or as was common, gas poisoning. It was a scene the police had witnessed many times before. An unexpected death with no signs of a burglary, no hint of a struggle, and although cyanosis had left her pale skin a slightly swollen mix of blue and red hues, beyond the decomposition there were no obvious cuts or bruises. No one had heard her scream. But that night, although no meal was cooked, nor cup of tea brewed, she'd had a client. Naked, except for a pink suspender belt and a black lace and silk bra, she had neatly folded the belt up to remove her knickers. The right cup of her bra had been pulled down, exposing her breast. And with a recently used condom, minus any semen, found under the bedside rug. It was clear that sex had taken place. What didn't make sense was her dress. As this blue and white flower pattern frock was the only one she had left. And yet, unlike her underwear, it was found behind her head, scrunched up and creased. It was a scene as ordinary as any of the detectives had investigated before. And yet, among its absence of evidence, lay something strange. As on the bedside dressing table, in a dark, ominous lump, was a clump of pubic hair, ripped out of the roots, which weren't jeans. In the room, an unidentified set of fingerprints were found. But when examined, none of them matched any of her foreknown clients, nor any of her friends, her family, or any of the tenants at Three Bedford Place. And neither did the clump of pubes. Described as a generous, good-natured girl, fond of life and without any enemies, it made no sense for anyone to hate her so much that they would kill her. She had no money, few clothes, no jewellery of any value, and anything she did have, she had either sold or shared with her clients. As a quiet woman, she had no rivals, no stalkers, no issues with her family, and her ex-lovers weren't bad men with a grudge. In short, she was careful about her clients. She stuck to her regular routine. She rarely went out. She didn't cheat the men she solicited or dated. And she always treated them well, which is why they liked her. No one had any reason to murder her. And yet they did.
examined at Holborn Mortuary. An autopsy determined she had been rendered unconscious by a fist, which had fractured the left of her jaw. Although strong and fiery if she needed to be, Jean was strangled with her own dress, and unable to fight back, it only took a small amount of pressure to end her life. On the 19th of June 1942, four weeks after her death, the St Pancras coroner Sir Bentley Purchase concluded that Jean Stafford was murdered by person or persons unknown, and the case was closed. Neither the tall man, the caller, or Johnny were ever found, and no one was arrested on suspicion of her murder. As of today, it remains unsolved. And yet, on the 30th of May 1953, a decade after the murder, a 51-year-old man walked into a police station at Elizabeth Bay in Sydney, Australia. His name was Joseph Lamb, a former tenant at Three Bedford Place who police stated knows more about her than anyone but denies being intimate with her. Interviewed, he said, I believed I was under suspicion for some time. I suffered a nervous breakdown and eventually came to Australia. And although he'd initially denied knowing what this private woman did as a job, he'd later admit she was a high-class prostitute. That day, Joseph identified a man from a photograph published in the papers who he said was seen with Jean on subsequent occasions. This was a man who regularly used prostitutes, a man who had strange sexual perversions like keeping the pubic hairs of his victims. And having murdered before, this West London serial killer had committed at least eight murders of women from 1943 to 53, who he had rendered unconscious with a punch, some gas, then strangled and raped, but had mutilated. The man he identified as a regular client of Jean Stafford was John Reginald Christie. folks there you go oh excitement excitement oh i wonder if you like a nice cup of tea he's back or is he back oh excitement oh. so that would be that would be before he started before he started his killing spree the ones that we dealt with earlier on it was the year before they've always said oh maybe he committed other murders it's likely that he did it's all slightly different, but there we go. Whoa, excitement. Um, I might, shall I make myself a little tea? Have I got time? It's, it's 11 o'clock. It's quarter past 11 in the morning. It's nice out. I think I'll make myself a little tea, not a biggie. Let's not do a biggie tea. Let's just do a little tea, a little tiny one. Uh, let's do that. I'm going to pop that in. I'm only going to have a little bit of a little bit of splishy sploshy in there. I'm going to go to the coffee shop in a bit. Have myself a nice little walk. Um, let's do a quaffy. A quaffy. Come on, quaffy. Oh my god. Come on, quaffy. Oh my god. There we go. I'm going to have one sugar because I, because I deserve it. Well done, Michael. One cup, one sugar, and some uh, some oat milk. Oh, life is good. And I did treat myself to some some Mrs. Crimble's, some Mrs. Crimble's macaroons, but they do vegan macaroons. Let's see how many calories are in there. Probably about a per macaroon. 
144. That's not actually too bad, actually. I, th I was really expecting. I'll have a look, because I'm sure the other ones are about 300. Maybe these are a bit better. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, that was... Every week I send off loads and loads of freedom of information requests to various archives to get um, some of these cases opened up because many of them are held for, like this case, this was, was held for more than 80 years. And I was, I think because it's an unsolved case. Um, so uh, I always put in my freedom of information requests and they always come back like a couple of weeks later, a couple of months, sometimes like a year, year and a half later sometimes. And they normally go, no, no, we're not releasing it. And this is the reason why. And I, I get it. But this one very quickly was approved. I think it's just been sitting there and no one's kind of FOI'd it. And it was on my list and they approved it. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, what else is going on in the world? Just on my 10 year boat anniversary. So I've been on my little my little boat, HMS Eva, uh, for uh, 10 years now, which is very exciting. Very, well, what an interesting decade I've had. So to treat myself, oh, Michael, oh, I treated myself to some new bedding, which is not to say I've only had one set of bedding for 10 years, but I, I thought, hmm, I, I was going to, I thought, yeah, let's do it for my uh, boat anniversary. So that was great. So I got some... I got a new duvet and I got new soft brush cotton bedding. It's very plain, but it's, and I got it from Tesco's. It was cheap, but it's really bloody comfortable and really nice. Not that I've had a chance to kind of enjoy it because obviously Eva's been on it all the time. And what I had to do was you can't wake her up because she gets really angry. She's normally pissed as well. Uh, and she, you know, the boat, the bed's covered in vomit. So what, I have, what I've learned to do is, do you know what? that trick where you have a table and it's got crockery on it and then you pull the sheet underneath and you go Hurr! and you pull the sheet away and then none of the crockery spills i've kind of learned to do that but with eva so you you learn not to spill tip her over because she gets angry but you learn not to uh, spill the vomit everywhere as well but apart from that apart from that so that was all good uh, oh thank you to a new patron supporter thank you to bina khalid so uh, that's literally just came in today as i was writing this so thank you, Bina. I'm going to send you your goodies ASAP. Uh, also, thank you to Lucy Barr, who very kindly sent me a birthday treat rather than Murder Mile website, which uh, I spent on Eva. Of course I did. Because that's, that's all I do is spend, spend all my money on, on Her Majesty. Her Majesty HRH, the important one. I'm, I, I'm not worth anything. I think I, I treated myself to a penny sweet. And that was it. And Eva said, that's all I deserve because I hadn't worked hard enough that day. Which is true. Which is true. Uh, have I said welcome to Extra Mile, the unscripted, unedited bit? If you, I mean, if, I mean well, well, if, 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 maybe this is the first time you come into this. I don't know. I don't know. But if, if it is, we do a little bit of waffle. We do some quiz questions shortly. I dive into some extra stuff on this case uh, uh and then you go about your lives and i go about mine mm, all good so let's do some quiz questions because i really want to tuck into those mrs crimbles i've already had three is the diet going well i haven't been on my diet for like three months now and it shows i've i've i'm, I'm like tweedledum and tweedledee in fact i'm both of them so but i've got a holiday this summer i decided not to go back on my diet until kind of end of march because i thought if i go on my diet early january by the time I go away in July, I'll have put the weight back on. So I thought, let's wait until April-ish. I've said April now. Then I can just power through the diet and look a little bit better on the beach. There we go. If Eva lets me, of course. So question number one, let's do this. Um, in what year was three Bedford Place built? I'll give you that to the nearest decade. Question number two, what was the real name? Uh, what was Jean's real name? Oh, your burpees. Question number three, in what village was she born? I've done these all as very early questions because sometimes when we do the quiz questions, sometimes I can't answer things in the extra mile bit because we're, I'm going, oh, I can't answer that because it's a quiz question. So I've just done all the really early stuff now. Uh, question number four, why did she choose the name Jean? Question number five, what had Jean been arrested for? Question number six, what colour was her hair? Question number seven, uh, what did her husband do as a job before he retired? 
Question number eight. How much inheritance did her husband have? Question number nine. What day was the last... What day? That almost makes sense. Um, question number nine. What was the last day that her husband said he saw her alive? I've retitled that question because I've badly written it again. And question number ten. What was the name of the pub in Brixton where she worked? Ow. <sighs> Oh, I've got a really sore big toe. I've had a sore big toe for ages. Right, let's dive into some extra stuff. Um, that phone call. Uh, so Edith, the housekeeper who kind of ran the house, she said it happened at 4.30pm. Uh, this is the man that the police suspect of uh, strongly committing the murder. Although, we can't. It's, it's like it's not like this man actually came into the house. Uh, but we know that she was waiting for someone. She said it happened around 40, 30, 30 p.m. He said, is Miss Stafford there? She said, no, He's she's gone to do some shopping. He said, will she be back in by six? Edith said, I guess so. The man asked if he could leave a note. Uh, she said, uh, I'll phone about six. Uh, I'm in the Royal Flying Corps now, and I'm a nephew of her father's brother, as if to make it nice and complimented. Com complicated i'm a nephew of her father's brother i'm i'm related to her stepsister's dog's flatmate's cousin uh he didn't give his name and she didn't ask um she thought that he said uh mentioned tring and that the raf base the police actually did research over there the nearest raf base to tring was actually cheddington police checked who was absent from that night uh there were 80 men who were absent that night that's because they were on uh, official leave 10 admitting to being in london uh they checked they couldn't check all the leave chits because they were all de destroyed as the man returned back but they did a kind of a proper check as much as they could uh, and they couldn't actually find any soldiers who were kind of uh awol at that time either um Edith said, I've used this in the episode, um, it was a long call, it was a long ring, so back in the 1940s, if it was a long ring, it was a local call, it was, if it was a short ring, it was a long call. Um, she knew it didn't come from a phone box, because normally at that point, I still remember these from the 80s and being confused by them, where you went into a phone box, you put your money in, you wouldn't pay for the call until the other person picked up the call, and then you'd have to press button A, uh, and button A would make your calls go in. So if it was a pay phone, uh, you'd hear nothing. Then you'd hear like a beep, 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 beep. And then the, you'd hear the kick, and then money would go through. And eventually you'd get your call. It always took a couple of seconds. Uh, and she said it didn't come through an operator either. It looked like it, it was a landline call. Uh, she said it was something like Johnny's voice, but it definitely wasn't his. Unfortunately, in none of the statements does she say what Johnny's voice sounded like but apparently it's, it wasn't accented um the note that she left was left in a waste paper basket uh she said it was slightly burnt at one end and in the bin was a john player special cigarette butt uh what else have we got seven o'clock as mentioned uh she did as she always did you know she made a little meal for joseph they didn't eat together they ate in their separate rooms but she would always leave it in the kind of cupboard for him he came in at seven o'clock to say thank you very much and to give her the plate back because it was her plate um he asked her if the caller was uh, she said she was sitting there waiting for a call he asked if the caller was expected for dinner and she said no i'll meet him out um she was sitting there as mentioned in her clothing the blue blue and white flower patterned dress uh it's it's kind of mayish so she's not kind of wearing lots of clothes she doesn't have to because uh, the weather was quite good that day uh, hence the window was slightly open although it's interesting that she had five layers of blankets on top of her um what else we got as mentioned she pretty much didn't have any jewelry left uh, she hadn't got a wedding ring anymore so the the little metal ring with the stone missing that was on her third finger of her left hand which is not the wedding finger and she had a small wristless wristlet watch uh all of them were cheap all of them were on her, her body afterwards um kitty who we don't hear really much about to be honest she's not there that much she i think she was a, a, a clerk room attendant at victoria station uh so if she was there 30 years later she would have uh, been the one dealing with the 
the body that we dealt with in meticulous um kitty was there she left at 9 p.m she came back at 10 p.m so she was she was away during the window when the murder is said to have occurred that's according to uh sir bernard spilsbury who did the autopsy and he said based on the timeline it was around seven uh 9 p.m to 10 p.m but don't forget that can be wrong uh joseph left at 7 15 p.m he went to fitzroy tavern on, on charlotte street to meet his, meet his friend mr claremont and they went to the york minster as we know both of these pubs are kind of uh, uh, uh known gay establishments in the 1940s they went they went and fed the ducks and then they went to irish house in piccadilly till about half past 10 and then they walked home arriving back at 11. now we know this definitely happened because we've got uh the La marge the landlord's daughter at the york minster she was talking to him he came back with mr claremont and i've got the mm. oh that sounds like the um the fuel boat i could have done with that uh he came back and the two guys who were underneath so um uh leading aircraftmen uh hudden and leblanc from the royal canadian air force um because leblanc lived on the first floor um him and hudden had actually said goodbye to each other for the day and just as hudden was coming out he bumped into joseph and i think because that because all gay men they were chatting to each other outside so just about 11 o'clock and then joseph said oh do you know i've got uh why don't we come into my basement we'll have a chat and some drinks so um george reginald pollard who was the uh, the, the the sex pest well i'll dive into that in a second he said around 10 p.m 11 p.m he heard foreign voices now we know what the foreign voices were this was the the canadians and joseph and his friend mr clermont they were down in the basement and they were talking to each other in french because don't forget uh these guys are canadian but also george uh sorry uh, joseph spoke french as well so that's what it was and then they left at 11 o'clock so uh pretty much everyone is accounted for except for george reginald pollard who's in the room next door to jeans um now he in 1932 at dorset assizes he was charged with eight months for gross indecency uh the original charge being buggery uh he was in the house from 7 30 p.m he said he didn't hear gene but noticed there was a light on in their room as the light shined through the kitchenette as i mentioned there was partition walls these are kind of as they did in this era to make a lot of money and they still kind of do it in a way today if you've got a big George, georgian house and the rooms are huge what they do is separate the rooms into three with very thin partition walls sometimes with glass panels at the top to let a little bit of light through because some of these rooms won't have windows at all uh, and that way they can make a lot of money out of few people so he was in one of these rooms next to jeans um he said he didn't hear anything he could hear the voices downstairs the walls were incredibly thin um and um w w with regards to his indecency charge uh, he was married he had children it looks like while he was down in weymouth i've, I've got the report somewhere uh it looks like he got really really drunk with uh, a seaman and it looks like they engaged in a little bit of sex so that's what it seems to be that's uh but that kind of ended all his career he was captain in the army and he kind of really messed up his career and he never really saw his family after that so everything kind of disappeared um joseph lamb returned at 11 p.m uh what else have we got and then he pretty much after the party had finished he went downstairs to bed uh he said he didn't notice whether the light was on although there was the frosted window in the kitchenette um there was a a crack at the bottom of the door that he that she often put kind of a duster in it because the mice kept coming through the the kitchen and her bedroom which really annoyed her she kind of really hated mice uh and he said that was in place uh in the morning the door was slightly ajar but you know it could have been it it could have slightly come ajar by itself maybe it wasn't fully locked but uh, as mentioned in the story uh it seems as if everything was kind of normal it looks for the police when they turned up as if she'd just gone to bed bed by herself in, f in fact even dr greg who was the divisional police surgeon who determined her life was extinct said she had advanced rigor mortis he put death between 8 p.m and 9 p.m the night before he'd heard from joseph and the other members of the of the flat that she'd been ill for quite some time a good couple of weeks and seeing the 
spot on the left ear and on the pillow there were no obvious signs of violence so he recommended an autopsy just to confirm what it was uh, he thought it was some kind of blood clot or something but with her bo- with her face having quite a lot of cyanosis because of uh, the decomposition therefore they could and and also as mentioned in the episode she was strangled quite lightly because she was already unconscious if she was struggling whoever was killing her would have had to use a lot of force but because she was already unconscious pretty much he'd he'd tried to strangle her with the um this is what the police worked out he tried to strangle her with uh her her dress but then he decided to use his hand uh although there was no real obvious signs of um of fingerprints on that in some cases you can kind of work out what size the man is but by the size of his hand but there there wasn't enough bruising to be able to work that out uh, no signs of struggle in the room no signs of disorder nothing seemed to have been taken uh, this was based on joseph who kind of knew what she had in the room and she did not have much uh, there was no ash in the ashtrays even though she smoked there were no glasses or cups used except the one that she used uh she'd been clearly been sitting by the fire he remembers seeing her sitting by the fire knitting waiting for the call at about 7 p.m so that all makes sense the curtains were closed um uh, because don't forget we're still in a blackout so you've got the big heavy blackout curtains there but the window was open uh window was open uh on the ledge he saw a bottle of milk and a jug containing parsley on the flat roof outside so she could have left it open or that could have been a route of which her killer may have escaped or he could have gone out through the front door. We don't know. We really don't know that. Uh, what else have we got? Fingernails. Uh, there was no fight as mentioned, but even if she, there had been a fight, because she had a habit of biting down her nails, her fingers, fingernails were incredibly short. So there would be nothing underneath her fingernails. Uh the condom was found uh she had three french letters as they call them three condoms uh, one of which was empty um the top had been torn off uh and was found under the rug near the bed so someone had clearly put it there they deliberately tried to hide the condom which is interesting if you've just had sex with a woman and then you try and kill her why not take the condom with you why hide it in the room it doesn't make sense on the dressing table there were 17 different articles so things like a hairbrush and kind of toiletries and stuff like that as well as a bunch of hair which is pubic hair um this definitely wasn't jeans it was darker in color and it was quite a quantity of pubic hair it was said um now this could be there could be two things here um if you go back to meticulous as mentioned in there um the guy who was the killer i can't remember his name off the top of my head see when i'm not working on cases everything goes out of my head because he was latvian he kept pubic hairs of his former lovers and i i did a little research on this and apparently this is a latvian thing that if you love someone you keep like a locket of their pubic hairs so maybe this was that but the police don't think it was the police think it was some some kind of anger happened at some point it doesn't make sense what the police says they did let me see if i've got it here uh, this is what the police said. There must have been a sudden surge of anger and Mrs. M- Mrs. Stafford pulled out, out the pubic hairs. Uh, then the man struck a blow that fractured her jaw and knocked her unconscious. He picked her up and placed her on the bed and realising that she knew him and because of her temper would avenge herself, the man decided to take the chance of being the man decided not to take the chance of being traced for murder no one knew his particulars and no one saw him in the house he twisted up the frock and tied it around her throat but as there were no marks at the back of the neck it is probable that he gripped her throat with his right hand and held her until she was dead the french letter was then torn off and slipped onto the carpet the man then awaited for darkness and slipped out of the house unobserved see the way that the body is on the bed the way that she's neatly laid out the way that she's folded every like her her stockings up the way that kind of one breast is partially exposed and they said that the way the body was positioned was quite neat it kind of more suggests that she would kind of willingly lie there that she was undressing as the other clients have said she would undress and then she'd get into bed it doesn't make sense that he would strike a blow with her and then he'd carry her nicely over to the bed and then place her down and she's still conscious and then he'd go oh you've just realized that you know me oh i need to strangle you it just 
there's just too many things that just don't make sense there. It makes more sense that someone had someone had a like a an angry sexual moment of some kind, you know. Like like with um like with kind of blackout ripper, you know, he the choice of killing someone or or letting them live is kind of really dependent on something as simple as whether she says something to him that he dislikes or something. Do you know we're dealing with those kind of assholes here, so it could be, it could be. Uh, what else have we got? What else have we got? Police investigation was. Uh, do you know they did as as good as they could, but they uh, they found quite a few of the. Um, uh, possible suspects and we we've we've dived into those into into the episode i didn't do all of their statements if you're a patron subscriber uh you will have access tonight to bad nanometers of which i always read out uh statements in full and people seem to be enjoying those it gives you a fuller insight into things and it gives us a chance to kind of really engage with stuff so if you're a patron subscriber for as little as i think it's two pounds a month you can enjoy that every week that could be a little treat for you um police report says it was known to uh that she was awaiting a visitor uh she had very little money uh so the police didn't think it was uh, a robbery it didn't seem like it was a sexually motivated attack they'd had sex but there didn't seem to be any sexual violence uh there didn't seem to be any kind of violence in total uh no one had kind of turned up deliberately with anything to kill her it's not that they turned up with you know stockings to strangle her that they'd used her dress so it was kind of a spur of the moment thing um but as mentioned of the three suspects that they were looking for the tall men they couldn't find johnny they couldn't find uh and the um the other one as well the caller they still don't know who the caller is and that will never be found uh they searched all of the taxi drivers and the night workers in the area they spoke to restaurants they knew because she would worked in pubs and stuff they checked pubs they checked bakeries to find out any more about her it was just couldn't find anything uh, in her room they found various photographs so they use those photographs to try and track down who she was and where she was from because don't forget she's still using kind of an alias really here uh and there was a fingerprint found which didn't belong to anyone known um this was actually found uh, on the enamel commode Ooh, so someone clearly had a plop plop uh and in there also was a new year's new year's card from johnny to jean so that's how they knew most of these people because she kept all these different things like the kind of the ration card from the norwegian guy or the um do you know uh, the letters uh, when uh joseph said to her after she died oh love you've got a, a letter that was actually a letter from alexander campbell so the police were able to track him down <clears throat> uh, ronald ward had left his details so she could come and see him uh, we got the interview letter from uh um coleman so do you know it was all there it was all there but we really don't know much about these people um tall man as many, i've put pretty much everything i can 48 to 52 six foot two inches tall uh dark hair deep set eyes swarthy complexion uh square jaw jewish nose broad shoulders athletic build and spoke with a deep voice never never seen again so we don't know much about him johnny was said to be 35 to 40 five foot five to five foot six clean shaven dark complexion he owns a car and he's believed to be a bookmaker i.e a you know gambler uh what else we got uh although uh he yeah yeah that, i think that was about right uh, edith had seen him six to seven times so she kind of knew his face and she knew his voice it was also said that johnny was said to have a job doing research for the government and that his job was hush hush although we don't know whether this is actually true at all um and the caller is pretty much unknown um clarence her brother had spoken to her a few times in the kind of the years before gene sometimes came to visit him and his wife in guildford uh he said uh, he, he he didn't know what she did but she never mentioned uh, about being threatened by anyone she didn't seem upset uh, she just seemed to he said uh she just seemed to be someone who enjoyed life she intended to have a good time while she was alive which was one of her statements uh, and it may seem obvious uh, it may seem a little bit ominous but let's not forget 
This is wartime. Everyone's surrounded by the Blitz. So people are just happy just to be alive. Uh, so Bernard Spilsby conducted the mortuary at Holborn, conducted the autopsy at Holborn Mortuary. Uh, she'd been dead for 12 hours by that point. There was a fracture on the left-hand side of the jaw just below the ear. But death had occurred 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. due to strangulation. Uh, James Stafford, her husband, uh, as mentioned in the episode, identified the body um, at Hoban Mortuary. So, so now everyone's probably gone, and the people who don't listen to Extra Mile, I'm going to do you a little little favour here. So let's go back to the Christie connection. So here we go. This was actually a letter that was near the start of the file, and I started reading it. I thought, oh, that's really interesting. But then, suddenly, I was like, mm, maybe not. So a letter was dated from Joseph Lamb in Australia on 30th of May, 1953. Now, he'd already moved to Elizabeth Bay in Australia by that point. Um, John Reginald Christie was arrested 31st of March, 1953, and his, his photo was all over the newspapers by that point. So he actually turned up at the uh, local police station there. Local police station got in touch with Scotland Yard. And uh, it was interesting. Joseph wouldn't give a statement, but he was happy for the police to give his information to to Scotland Yard, which was really weird. You would think he would be happy to sit down and give a statement. Uh, so by that point, he was about 50 years old. Uh, he called the police and alleged that uh, he had identified the man who was seen with Gene Stafford on subsequent occasions from a photograph published in the newspaper as Christie. Uh, he suggested Christie might have been responsible for the murder. Uh, at the time of that letter, uh, Christie had been arraigned already. Uh, and although the police had spoken to uh, the director of public prosecutions because this was already going forward as a criminal trial they didn't want to upset that criminal trial by ad by adding by questioning him about this so uh, christie was never questioned about the murder of gene stafford at all uh, it kind of makes sense you, d you don't want to fuck up a, a court case that's going well with something that may not even exist um when asked why he didn't mention uh, why asked Asked why Joseph didn't mention about Christie in his original statement, he said he didn't see the significance of it until now. Uh, Joseph Lamb refused to make any statement in connection with this matter and asked about his whereabouts in this country. And he asked that his whereabouts in this country be kept confidential from the police. Uh, as mentioned, he, he felt that he was under suspicion of her murder. Um, he'd have had a nervous breakdown and then he fled to Australia where he could start a new life um so police started looking at the details of this uh at the time of the murder john christie was serving as a metropolitan police's war reservist on harrow road as we know uh they checked the duty log and it shows that he was on sick leave uh on the from the 15th to the 26th of october 1941 which covers would cover the alleged visit if he was coming to town which do you know what we even though all of the ladies were murdered in and around uh, in his room that we know of, we know he visited other prostitutes. If we go back to those episodes, you, we know that he picked up prostitutes in pubs and we know that he visited other locations, other brothel, brothels with prostitutes. Um, so that covers that covers the, the, the alleged phone call. So uh, the phone call, what I'm making reference to is when... Um, when Jean first went to Three Bedford Place with the tall man. Now, we know he, we know he isn't the tall man, and we will come on to that in a second, because this is the thing that Joseph, who introduced her into the house, said, uh, oh, yeah, this guy was kind of 48 to 55, which is, which is right. That's about Christie's age. Six or two, well, he's five inches shorter than that. Dark hair, he doesn't have any. He almost has almost no hair. Deep set eyes, yet yeah, we can go with that. Swarthy complexion, no, he's a pasty motherfucker. Square face, no, long. Jewish nose, no. Broad shoulders, no. Athletic build, definitely not. Spoke in a deep voice, absolutely not. As we know, he had a kind of a whisper. Even the police would say that. Um, which is not to say that he didn't get confused that the man who he turned who turned up with her when she first moved into three bedford place the person who was known as the tall man um maybe that is but maybe he got confused and maybe she did she was seen with christy on other dates um 
Now, the police did look. They, they went to go and see his uh, police, his war reserve records to see when he was working on the night of the 18th and 19th of May 1942, which is the day of the murder. Unfortunately, they were not available. They, they'd been lost during the Blitz. So, could be Christie, might not be Christie. Or, uh, as the police would say, there was no evidence that Gene Stafford was murdered by John Christie. Uh, it, of course, it is assumed that John Christie murdered many more women. He regularly visited prostitutes in the West End and the city. Uh, most of these women were murdered in his home. But if you look at the connections, there are things there. Do you know, he he does pick on vulnerable women. He does have a tendency to kind of punch them first and then strangle them. He, in some cases, does use gas to strangle them, uh, you know, domestic gas before the, the gas uh, before they added sulfur into it to start making people be sick um so it's possible this was kind of something that i was going to save as an end thing where uh, i thought i'd save this for you guys but for me i think this is kind of interesting um it could be john christie he could, i don't think he's the tall man i don't think he's there i don't think he's johnny either because he's the wrong age and he's, he looks entirely wrong i don't think he's the the caller either because it because Edith would have said he had a he had a a quiet whisper a raspy voice and he she, she doesn't say that I don't think it's any of those three men could he be a potential client I think so I think so he, you know there's loads of prostitutes about and there's a lot of connections in here that we could make but there's a lot of connections that we can make to other people as well so he might not be but it's interesting that Joseph Lamb would kind of come forward with this a year later so maybe having had his breakdown maybe it, it was it was coming up to the it was the anniversary it happened the 10 year anniversary actually no it's the 11 year anniversary so he's starting to break he saw christy in the papers maybe he connected the dots maybe this is the truth or maybe this is a lie a, a kind of an alibi to get joseph away from this although i don't think joseph has anything to do with it i think he, i think he's just a nice guy as mentioned he's gay but that doesn't mean you know he's not bisexual it's just not mentioned there in a lot of these police reports from the 40s they just say gay they don't say bisexual so you know could be it could be one or the other could be both we don't know he could have had love for her he could have been jealous about something i don't think he, i don't think it is him at all uh and could it be christy i don't know i don't know i really don't know but it's just interesting that around that point that uh, this guy would go oh it's definitely christy i definitely saw her with him on several occasions and we know that he did visit prostitutes on many occasions. So could be Christy, might not be Christy. Could be Joseph Lamb, might not be Joseph Lamb. Could be uh, George Pollard, the next, uh, the guy who lived next door, might not be George Pollard, the next door. So uh, we don't know. So <laughs> this is this is why I deliberately at the start of this episode so didn't say uh, it's unsolved because I knew people would go, oh God, I don't like un unsolved. So anyway. That was a long extra mile. I'm sorry about that, but I think it, we needed it for the end. Whew, let's do the quiz questions, and then I can I can FRO down to the coffee shop. Right, here's the quiz questions. In what year was Three Bedford Place built? I'll give you to the nearest decade. It was 1805. So if you're within 10 years of that, I'll give you that. Uh, question number two, what was Jean's real name at birth? It was Agnes Martin. Question number three, in what village was she born? Deep Car. Question number four. Uh, why did she choose the name Jean? It was after the film star Jean Harlow. Question number five. What had Jean been arrested for? It's a trick question. Nothing. She'd never been arrested for anything, but she was cautioned for soliciting, which is not an arrest. Uh, question number six. What colour was her hair? Uh, it was platinum blonde. Question number seven. What did her husband do as a job before he retired? He was a sports writer. Question number eight. How much inheritance did her husband have? It was £3,000, which is a quarter of a million pounds today. Question number nine. What, when was, what day did her husband last see her alive? It was Valentine's Day, 1938. And what was the name of the pub in Brixton where she worked? It was the Angel Arms. 
So I hope you enjoyed that, folks. Oh, that was an interesting one. Oh, uh, I, I haven't quite decided what next week's episode is. I've researched loads. I just haven't decided which one to put in. But then again, this one wasn't meant to be here. By, because I found it in the archives, I was like, I'm definitely going to do this one. And I'm glad that I did. So anyway, thank you very much, folks. I hope you all enjoyed that. Have yourself a good day. I'm going to have a coffee and a Mrs. Crimble's. So stay safe. Be good. Lots of love. Bye.